Hi Maureen, We've, we finally made it. The last time you were here in Edgeware was five years ago. And every week since then, I've been asked, no, so when's Maureen coming back? And here you are, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> and I wish the her... congregation could have seen the last 20 minutes. Talk about four Jews, 12 opinions. <laughs> it was like a scene from the Marx Brothers. I can only tell you it's funnier than anything I've ever done. Take you it away, Dave. Big you have to film that bit, though. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, there's no oh. raffle this time. Do you remember the raffle last time? I, uh, um, and although most of the people at the dinner in Edgware are still talking about how funny you made it. I made a raffle funny? I must be a genius. You were his, absolutely. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you off record what you said. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's leave that. I was auction um, uh, in Hull, uh, a bag of meat. <laughs> <laughs> a bag of meat was the first prize from a local butcher. Was, uh, was it kosher? I have it. There's no kosher butcher in Hull. There's a, scarcely a community. Have no. we started or are we on? Yeah, we're on. We're on. Oh, we've okay. Got, okay. We've got 100 people in there so far. Oh, heavens to bed. That's the biggest audience I've had in six months. <laughs> I'm sure not. I'm sure not. Right, can I talk about you now for a minute? <laughs> Okay, go on. A minute or ten. Right, Maureen Lippmann was born in Hull, trained at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Stop me if it gets too boring for you. Yeah, right. I'm bored already. Uh, and learned her trade in Laurence Olivier's company at the Old Vic from 1971 to 1973. Good She's good. well known for playing Joyce Grenfell in the biographical show Rejoice on stage and television, and BT, Who Can Forget the Ologies, in a series of award-winning television commercials for British Telecom. <laughs> Maureen's 19 West End productions include, include Wonderful Town, Variety Club, GB Award, See How They Run, Olivier Award, Oklahoma, Olivier nomination, Peggy For You, Lost in Yonkers, The Sisters Rosenbike, Florence Foster Jenkins in Glorious, and her one woman show, Alive and Kidding, at the Duchess Theatre. In 2012, Maureen directed and appeared in a successful tour of Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park, and in 2013 in Old Money by Sarah Woolley at the Hampstead Theatre. She played Clara in Priestley's When We Are Married and Madame Armfelt in Trevor Nunn's production of A Little Light Music, an Olivier, an Olivier nomination at the Garrick. And her, and her favourite role so far was Ellie in Oliver Cotton's Daytona and Vita in Harvey at the Theatre Royal Haymarket, that was in 2015. In 2016, she started in a highly praised production of My Mother Said I, should, I Never Should at the St. James Theatre. She was wire in the 2006 series of Doctor Who, The Princess of France, in the BBC versions of Love Labour's Lost, and appeared Smiley People, He Kills Coppers, Holby Return, and Holby City, sorry, and Midsummer's Murders. In 2003, she took over the Rovers' return in Coronation Street as Lillian. Her film work includes Educating Rita and her mother in Polanski, the pianist. David. Yeah. Is don't that give, enough? Don't give up the day job. Just, <laughs> just put me on. I've been told that before. Do you want, shall I stop here? Yeah. Is that enough already? They know what I've done. All yeah. right. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Right. So, um, um, you did talk about your children, Amy and Adam, and they're both writers and the grandchildren, Ava and Sasha, are mm -hmm. very good with crayons. You, you, you've got to get them in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> during, during lockdown, or schlockdown, Maureen, Maureen has been writing articles, painting, crocheting, dusting off the intermediate French. This is what I'm going to tell them. Why are you uh, telling them this, David? Oh, don't you want me to? Oh. Okay. All right. So, as the title of our Zoom tonight is Maureen and Schlockdown, maybe we should start there. As the title of our Zoom tonight is Maureen and Schlockdown, maybe we should start there. Is that okay? Can, uh, <laughs> I'm can a bit ask the first question. Good evening. You've got to love him, haven't you? Because what else would you do? He's adorable. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this whatever it is. We've gone from boo baby boomers to baby zoomers. And uh, it's, it, I can only say that lockdown has been very interesting, has it not? Because at first, 
I thought it was incredibly liberating, I have to say, before we realized just how bad this whole thing was. I thought, this is it, freedom from ambition. I no longer have to get up there and sing an Alma Cogan song every day. I no longer have to please my mother. I can kick ambition up the tochus and forget about it, you know? And then I started spray painting all the furniture in the garden. And then I, I, did, I started doing acrylic painting and watercolor. I baked a casserole. I even baked Passover biscuits for the first time in my life. You could have shot an army with them. Um, and then I started on my French tapes. Um, I, I, I did drama classes every week with my grandchildren, um, taught them tongue twisters. You should see my five-year-old um, saying, Betty bought butter, but the butter Betty bought was bitter, so Betty bought better butter. Uh, it, it, it's been great. And we're actually putting on a play on Sunday for my daughter-in-law's um, <laughs> my daughter-in-law's mother, Mahatonim's. Uh, birthday. It's called the Gorilla and the Unicorn, although the Guardian, when I told them about it, called it the Guerrilla, uh, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. -L -L so that's so Guardian, you just can't believe it. Um, uh, so I'd started doing all the garden, I've been planting, I've spent £9,000 at the garden centre when it opened up. And then now as the weeks have gone on, I don't know about you, but I've uh, got a little bit uh, now I need a nitol every night and vitamin B3 in case and I'm spraying up my nose and I'm um, washing my hands before I go out the house, after I come into the house, during the, I've got a, washing them in the car with bacterial wipes and uh, down to, I don't cook much anymore. I'm, I, I only watch the repair shop because I love the repair shop. It makes me cry my eyes out. Um, and I can't put bird seed out anymore for the nesting birds, which I adored because I got rats in my courtyard. And that is another whole mish of gas, I can tell you, because it's not, a, you don't have a rat catcher anymore, you have a pest technician. And he comes with a tote bag and he, he puts poison down and the rats are so clever that they schlep the poison in its bag to a place where they can picnic on it later. And then they have swum from the back of my house to the front through the water system. And they are lying twitching on my doormat. I mean, the postman had to be put on a life support machine. So when the rat pest technician came, he, he picked up the dead rats. Um, you pay a lot to live in my area. He picked up the dead rats, but of course there's no restaurants now, so they're everywhere. And he put them in his tote bag and I said to him, where's your van? And he said, no, I'm a walking uh, pest technician. And I said, where are you walking to? He said, the tube. <laughs> so, you know, go back on the tube at your peril because there's a bloke sitting next to you with a tote bag full of dead rat. So, uh, um, you know, it, it's become, uh, I'm actually now, I don't know about you, but I'm actually quite frightened now to resume normal life because I've become a sort of hermit uh, and, and I go out for my walk every day. I sometimes have a coffee with, with a friend. Um, uh, my daughter comes to see me <laughs> on a Friday night. I go into the garden of my son's house to rehearse the children in the gorilla and the unicorn. Uh, um, and, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, the thought of ever going anywhere again is 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 quite quite scary. I, I feel I've got used to living a life where I don't do anything. I thank God if I sleep the night. I'm so grateful. I fall on my knees first thing in the morning, which I probably should have been doing for years. Um, uh, and um, yes, I mean I do my yoga once a week. Uh, and in the mornings, you know, I do all that. Um, so, because I'm desperate not to get as fat as I was when I finished in Coronation Street last time, because in September, I was supposed to be going back to Coronation. They're taking the wrinklies back. It's a big day in September. And um, uh, I don't know how I'm going to get there because I'm sure in hell not getting on that train again. Although I actually was wearing a mask during the shoot, I came back every time from Manchester in a mask and people looked at me as if I was nuts sitting on a train with a mask on. But I very early on began to be quite prescient about this disease. And, uh, uh, and what can you say? It, you know, you can, you, it, they're gonna tell us, aren't they, one day, 
that it's airborne. And we have a government who've screwed up. Uh, I think any government, frankly, would have screwed up because it is, as they keep saying, without precedent. But I think the fact that we still are not testing properly uh, and that, 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 you know, fairly intelligent people, such as myself, still don't know what the bubble means. Can I go to my, can I go in the house? If I go to my friend for Friday night, can I go in? Can I stay the night? Can I, um, should I disinfect my car when I've had anyone in it? I, I know, I know the truth is out there, but I, I really can't get it into my head what is on and what is off. So, yeah, I mean, hmm, what can I say? It's, it's um, as the Chinese say, and they should know because they've made it so. Um, we live in interesting times. I, I think. Don't, don't you think that um, worldwide this is? I think. I don't think anybody really knows what to do. They're doing things that they should be doing or they think they should be doing. Um, well, some are managing it better than others. Um, uh, New Zealand, a lot of the places that they say with women leaders have managed it better, Finland. Um, Israel, of course, managed it superbly at the beginning. But whether, whether some COVID-infected uh, Iranians got into Israel, or not, I don't know, but they've got it again. And we don't know how long the the, uh, the the period of immunity lasts, if you've had it. I mean, I think Boris had the shock of his life. He nearly died. Yeah. But even so, he's, he's not a person that you would trust with details, is he? I mean, uh, Keir Starmer is running rings around him in the house. And thank God, because uh, somebody has to say to him, it's not enough to be aware of a report you're the prime minister, you have to read the report and then you'll know what everybody's talking about rather than relying on that odd little uh, garden gnome he's got sequestered with him. It's, it, but it's, very, it's very difficult. I mean, he's, he's in a situation where I don't think his advisors, I mean, my, one advisor is a, a great professor over there and there's another professor over there. And, you know, they're, they're at lockerhead sometimes. You know, no, nobody yeah. really knows. I was reading something about viruses, and now all of a sudden there's something completely different that has just suddenly brought up that they found yeah. viruses do. And it's, I, yeah, it's very scary. And we do not want to bore your congregation this evening just talking about how frightening everything is because I think they've tuned in to avoid talking about that. So, you know, basically, we're, we're going to get through this because we have to. And uh, if the world needed a cull, I'm afraid um, they, they, they've got it. Um, uh, some things, of course, are wonderful. The, the air is clean, the birds are singing their heads off, the trees look greener. And in some ways, um, Venice is clean. <laughs> it's, it's, it's done as all things do, you know, it's got bad and good elements. And one of the problems of living in this world is, is that there's only, there's, you know, there are people out there who are very certain. And as we know, certainty is very, very dangerous, particularly for us. Uh, if everybody's convinced that um, the Jews are all uh, rich and running the world, uh, then that's that's a very frightening thing. When the police force in Germany, oh please, I don't want to depress you. I'm let's <laughs> talk about something nice. Uh, we, hmm? I'm just wondering, should we uh, should we go out to the audience and see if any anybody's got any questions for the moment? Well, certainly, it depends how far into the thing you want to go. I mean, there's a lot of Coronation Street uh, fans out there and people who've watched it forever. So it might be worth just telling you that um, the first time I went into Coronation Street, I was only there for two weeks because um, uh, Julie Goodyear had had a meltdown. And uh, when she saw that I'd taken over the uh, Romans Return, she got better very quickly. And it's, it, um, it, you know, when Jack, my late husband wrote his first episode, it was episode 13. And he, he'd gone to Granada with Tony Warren. He knew him very well. And Tony rang him after the show and said, well, what did you think? And he said, I think it's absolutely amazing. He said, never mind you, what did your mother think? And it was always uh, a trailblazing show because it cut across all the intellectuals loved it. Laurence Olivier went down on his knees to uh, Doris Speed in the, in the corridor of Granada. 
Oh, she said, well, thank you very much. I feel the same way about you, only manifold. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when I went into it this time, um, it felt like a very organic thing. I like the character. She's a right nasty piece of work. Um, not much of a stretch. And um, uh, and I, everyone was very nice to me. Um, the guy playing my grandson, Tyrone, he's been in, in this program since he was a fetus and he's just the most professional and nice guy. Um, and uh, I love working with, you know, the older people, David Nielsen, who, um, who is Roy, uh, he's such a good actor. And, and I think it's, um, you know, there are many, many, many writers. <laughs> so sometimes it's better than others, but on the whole, um, I think it's still a, a pretty good show and I'm pretty proud to be associated with it. Um, during the lockdown, I, I've been doing Gogglebox and that would not have been probably my prime choice had I had been offered, you know, some of Kristen Scott Thomas's cast-offs. I probably would have taken that rather than Gogglebox, but um, I've actually enjoyed it enormously because Giles Brandreth and I, are, you know, we get on very well. It's just the content of what they show us is just bizarre. And at first when I went into it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I thought it was going to be something like front row. You know, they were gonna, I was going to make assessments of movies and, and program the television. So I thought she was better in, you know, when I'm, I thought the camera worked. But of course it's not that. It's just a group of very loud people sitting around going, oh my God, oh Jesus, oh look at that. <laughs> and, and that came as a bit of a shock because Giles and I were being kind of witty badinage and then realised that if we kept up the witty badinage, we would never be in it. And when they showed us naked attraction and all the dingly dangly bits, I could not believe my eyes. And I actually walked out of the room and I said, uh, sorry, I've got one life and I don't intend to spend it on these aubergines waggling away and uh, <laughs> they didn't show that but but then I gradually got the measure of it that you know you've got to speak very quick sentences and you've got to do it with a kind of you know one-liners have got to be kind of I'm not watching this you shouldn't watch this jack whatever you know it's got to be quick and over with and in the end we we always had a good time but then I would watch it on Friday night and think Oh, they missed out that bit where I was really funny. <laughs> and, um, um, uh, you know, it's, it's been, um, you have to keep working. And I'm so, I'm hellish fortunate to be able to keep working because some of my, you know, younger friends from Little Night Music and these talented singers and actresses, of course, you know, they can't waitress when they're out of work. They there is nowhere to wait. So a lot of them are in really bad. I had an idea that I would organize. I'm a terrible organizer, but that I, I mean, I'm very last minute. You want to come to my house, come up, at, you know, at, you want to come to my house, come five minutes before and, and don't tell me about it because then I'll be very, I'll, I'll make a meal. My mother always said, oh, Maureen, you can just take whatever lot of stuff you've got in your fridge and make it into nothing in no time at all. I have to have advance warning. I, I, I can't, but um, um, yeah, I um, completely forgot what I'm talking about. So yeah. many. Should we change the subject for a minute? <laughs> David, can, I, can I just in, interject? Please. Uh, if anybody wishes to ask a question, if you would show your virtual hand by going to participants or clicking on your name, and if you raise your virtual hand, then I will bring you into the conversation. Thank I'm you. putting five pound on the first question being about BT. <laughs> <laughs> you remember. Yeah. And we have a question here, David, from Joy. <laughs> from Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Um, do you prefer live theatre or TV work? Do I prefer live, uh, live theatre or TV? I actually really like whatever I'm not doing. So if I'm, if I'm uh, in the theatre and it's eight times a week, I'm thinking, oh, why don't I ever get offered those drama series on TV? And if I'm ever doing, you know, a drama series, which 
then I'm thinking, I really ought to be pursuing my art on stage. I mean, I've, certainly the best and most memorable jobs that I've ever had um, have been on stage. I mean, you know, now I'm pretty nervous. I mean, I, I actually, on the first night of my last one woman show uh, in Edinburgh and then at the Purcell Rooms last year, I think that was, um, that was called Up For It. Um, and uh, I stood, the, the opening of the show was um, a leg in a fishnet tight, fishnet tight coming out the curtains and then a hand in a glove. And then I was on a step ladder behind the, um, behind the curtain so that my head was eight foot higher than my leg and my head yeah, with a little gag. And I sang a little song. And I stood on the top of that step ladder on the first night at the Purcell rooms, right? And I thought to myself, I will never ever do this again. I never want to feel this ill and frightened in, the, in my life. And then, you know, you do it and then suddenly it's just another job, <laughs> you get through it. Um, but you do get more frightened. I don't think I had a nerve in my body when I started out, uh, whether it was Laurence Olivier or it was um, Dennis Quilly and, or, or Deborah Carr, you know, I just went on. <laughs> but you do get a little more scared. But, you know, the first night of Oklahoma, I remember, you know, at the, at the um, National Theatre, we the, all the dressing rooms look into it, uh, an atrium. And Helen McCrory was on Desert Island just talking about what fun that is. But when we were at the old Vic waiting to move into the National Theatre, we all thought, actors all thought, we'd be able to see the Thames. Because wouldn't that be nice? You know, or, you know, even I, I now realise that we are the bottom of the pile. The actors, it's all about everything else. Even at Coronation Street, no dressing room has a window. And Rula Lenska and I, we share this, you know, we... Certainly are very careful not to eat beans or Jerusalem artichoke the day before we're both in, in that little tiny dressing room with no window. Um, so, uh, but I mean, Hugh Jackman, Oklahoma, Trevor Nunn, the revolving stage going round with just me in the middle of a thousand seater theater and me with my little Stetson hat and my churning butter here like that, squinting up at the sun. And the joy of that orchestra and that voice suddenly singing, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There, you know, I, was, um, I was very pleased to see him every night, apart from, of course, the one night when, the afternoon matinee, when he had a bad chest and he sang, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze. And he came on and he took off his Stetson and he said, ladies and gentlemen, because he's Australian, as you probably know, I'm sorry, uh, I got a bad chest infection. I thought I'd be able to do it, but I can't. So I'm going to leave you in the <laughs> capable hands of Aunt Ella. And he kissed me on the top of my hat and he left me on stage with a thousand people because there was no curtain, there's no curtain at the Olivier. So I looked at them and they looked at me and I looked at them and they looked at me. And finally I said, we got better looking ones than him backstage. Don't you worry about a thing. And then, of course, they had to get me off with a hook. So um, uh, it was funny. It was funny. And I never let him forget that. And his understudy was sitting upstairs in the dressing room playing Scrabble. And he needed those brown trousers, I can tell you. And he came on and he's a beautiful singer. And he got, uh, oh, what a beautiful morning off Pat. And then uh, then he... he um, and then he got to chicks and ducks and geese better hurry when I take you out in the Surrey. When I take you out in the Surrey with the fray and jump top. Oh, and I realized that after six months, I didn't know the words. I didn't learn his words. I just learned mine. So I couldn't help him. There's a wonderful story, which... Um, Someone, an elderly gentleman told me on a cruise ship, and it's with Vera Lynn passing, I, I thought of this a lot. He used to be the um, bellhop, the, the, the call boy, actually, at the Palladium when he was a kid. And Judy Garland was opening, and she was in a terrible state. And uh, she got on stage and she sang, um, 
you made me love you. I, I did, I, 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 and, and, and it just was, you know, the orchestra stopped and she started again and she forgot again. And finally someone stood up in the audience and said, I know this song, Judy, come on, sing it with me. You made me love you. I did not want it was Vera Lynn. <laughs> So whether it's an apocryphal story or true, but she got her back on and uh, and she should have a Spitfire fly past just on the benefit of that, shouldn't she really? <laughs> so yes, in answer to your question, um, most of the memorable moments are certainly on stage. Um, and sometimes it's sublime and sometimes it's just journeyman hard work and sometimes at five to six, in winter, you don't want to leave the comfort of your lovely toasty home and your kids and your husband and get in the car and drive to the West End. And sometimes, you know, it's it's just everything works. But, you know, as I probably told you five years ago, because I can't remember what I said, there was a night in Wonderful Town at Watford where a Saturday night is not the best night in the theatre because it's a night when people think they should go to the theatre on a Saturday night. So it's a bit like a charity audience. They tend to sort of sit there. And this particular Saturday night was fantastic. I don't know why, but the band was all there. Sometimes you get depth and in the middle of it, yeah, you know, ooh. Uh, everyone was there and the cast were all there. There were no understudies on. And the show just shot. And it was just wonderful because it is a great little Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein show. And uh, he did actually come to Watford to see it. So I met him there, which was phenomenal. And I'm so pleased I did. Um, and I took my bows, almost crying. This is what I came into this business for. I'm so grateful to be here. This is like one of the most amazing nights of my life. And I sort of floated to the wings. And my co-star, he held the curtain for me and he said, how much do you pay in car insurance? And it was a perfect example of empathy. You know, it's like you think one thing, he's thinking something completely different. And with all this no platforming, you know, this is an important thing to remember that every opinion is not necessarily yours and you've got to listen to it and you might change your opinion. And you certainly don't stop someone from speaking unless they're committed races you don't stop even then you know you 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 do it with with cleverness you bring them down but you don't stop them and uh and i feel very sorry for uh Germaine greer who's made women's lives infinitely better over the years and for jk rowling who has educated our children uh about it's about nothing nothing uh and as a you know, you look at the TV programmes and you see they're all about bullying. They're all about humiliation. You know, you get a bunch of, of painters on a programme and they're told, put down your brushes, you have four minutes. And the same with all the cookery programmes. You've got 20 minutes, 20 minutes now. You know, move. Yes, chef. No, chef. Stick it up your top of chef as far as I'm concerned because I'm, I've reached an age where I don't want people... Uh, bullying me and humiliating me in the jungle and and uh, telling me that uh, my dance steps were really dear, not very good dear. I, I'm sorry I'm not up for that and I don't and I think that culture of, of bullying and humiliating is spread and it's it, if this it's got to stop it's got to stop because the the, the inevitable result of that is a totalitarianism, which we're not really used to in this country, and neither should we be. Yes, can I bring, more can I bring in some questions? Uh, younger words, I'm not sure. Um, I'll unmute you. And you're on. Hi, Maureen. Uh, Maureen, I've been wallowing, like many others, in uh, cultural delights. So I've been watching streams of uh, recitals, concerts, drama, um, which have not been 100% successful, but have been, in the main, absolutely wonderful. As we're all worried about the future of live theatre, and understandably so with all the uncertainties, uh, maybe I'm missing something. Isn't it a way forward to conceive of the theatres 
not putting on war and peace or massive musicals, but putting on um, drama with small or medium casts without any audiences to reduce risk, then charging a reasonable moderate sum, which most people surely be, would be happy to pay, which would mean a win for everyone. The money would come in. You may make even more by streaming a successful play than um, if you were charging the West End prices. Isn't that a way we can think forward or have I missed something? <laughs> I don't think you've missed anything. I think you're, you're onto something good. And that's, that's what's been happening, of course, during the pandemic. Um, but there are, we do have these wonderful buildings and there has to be a way um, if you can go into a swimming pool and you can go into a gym, there has to be a way that we can go into a theatre. But I mean, again, um, on the plus side, you know, the West End was pretty well full of moribund produce. I mean, musicals that have been on for years, even, you know, The Mousetrap is the first thing that's opening. Um, compilation shows and um, uh, and plays, you know, the, the Who Done It and Woman in Black. You know, it has got into a, a state. It's like the freezer, not the fridge. So, in a way, uh, necessity being the mother of invention, you know, something will have to happen. Shows will have to be smaller. You're right. And, uh, and, and you will have to have a way of, of spacing people out so that, you know, how you do that at the Hampstead Theatre Club when you're practically sitting on people's knees anyway, I don't know. But it could in some way lead to um, less price, you know? You, you don't want to pay the prices that you were paying in the West End, whatever anybody says, um, we've turned it. We just follow Broadway. And I think a pared down, um, uh, more careful balance of plays because you know the way to it's not fair that at the National Theatre you have 12 weeks to rehearse and everything uh, is there the costume department the wig uh, and it's judged by the same critics and in the same mood as a play at the chocolate factory that's had four weeks to rehearse uh, uh, and uh, uh, and has a very very modest budget. It's all you know, but 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 the critics come in and they judge it in the same way. So, yeah, I think there may be some good to come out. Of it. It's painful at the moment, but it could be an exition uh, of a of a you know of a benign tumor, um, which which actually helps the body whole. So I think it's a good idea, and I would certainly, if I were you. Put it in front of um, the Mavens, the Nicholas Heitners, and the Rufus Norrises, and the Michael Grandages, and 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 say, because people are loving, they're loving these uh, transmissions of plays. Because why not? What happens when you go to Wimbledon and you see the players playing? What do you do? You watch the screen. <laughs> and in the old days, the the um, plays would you, they would transfer to Hollywood films. Uh, but now the films are what go on in the theatres. There's a homogenization of, of drama. The one thing we know is that we can't live without it. And even my production of The Gorilla and the Unicorn on Sunday afternoon for Shawnee and Booney will be, we will be nervous. Um, there will be a warm up. The, uh, the children age five and eight will do tongue twisters and, uh, and, and it will matter to us that we get laughs. Uh, human beings need to, to get closure and catharsis. They need to put their problems into a place where they can view it passionately or dispassionately. And it's the same with, with, um, with why we read books, isn't it? To be taken to another place. We need art, we need um, drama, uh, and those things cost. So, um, yeah, but, you know, it's not number one priority. Number one priority should be not clapping the nurses, but paying the nurses. It bothers me when Boris says build, 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 because you can always get money for buildings, but you can't get it for people. Uh, so, um, you know, we come a little low down the pecking order, but we matter. You matter a lot. The arts are an important part for this country. Where yeah. 
Wherever you can trip. Music as well. The and it, it's a crying shame that people can't get to these arts at the moment. And ballet. And ballet. Well, ballet comes off worse because of the proximity. You can't social distance in ballet because the ballerina would drop to the floor. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? We do. Uh, Ruth Hill. You've, you're on, Ruth. Uh, it's him, not her. Oh, oh, you shouldn't be called R Ruth, darling. It's like a boy named Sue. It's, on, you know, on, your whole... on a good day, I know to do what I'm told. <laughs> I had the pleasure, I'm not sure it was for her, but I had the pleasure to perform one evening in front of your mother. <laughs> it, was, it was quite an experience, but it's not for public uh, discussion. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think your mother would say about lockdown? <laughs> First of all, you have to tell me what, what you were doing in front of my mother. It wasn't porn, was it? it? it it's going to take a couple of minutes. You really want to know? Yeah. Okay, so I did a comedy show in front of your mother many years ago, and we turned up in Hull to the school for a week so evening. We were told it was going to be 150 people. You could seat 5,000, and only <laughs> half the audience turned up. And as my pal and I were warming up and practicing our moves on the stage, which we'd never been on uh, in all our, our uh, uh, lives, lesbian years. Mm -hmm three quarters of an hour before the doors opened, your mother walked in. <laughs> and we said, would you mind, please? Can we rehearse? Would you give us a chance? She said, it's fine, don't mind us. We'll sit here and watch. We'll pretend we're not here. So it took 10 minutes to persuade her to give us a little bit room. It was absolutely fine, but when she sat through the show, it was hard to find a smile. <laughs> I know, I know. There's a very famous bit of film of Barry Humphreys doing an evening with at London Weekend Television. You know, they did those things. And I took my mother along. And, and I, I, you can see it very clearly because I'm wearing a yellow jacket and she's next to me. And the whole audience is rocking with laughter at Barry Humphreys, except for this one person who's rigid and sitting like this. Yes, that's how, she... that's how she was. Absolutely, a face of stone. I can't understand what anybody finds funny about him. Um, and indeed, there was an occasion, it was the first night of my um, uh, live one woman show. And she said to me afterwards, um, there was a man sitting next to me and he didn't come back for the second half. And I think he was a critic because he was making notes all the way through. So I, I thought about this and I phoned up the press office and I said, my mother said there was a man and she said, leave it with me. And she came back to me and she said, yes, yes, it was Michael Coveney, actually. She said, and he moved seats in the second half because there was a woman next to him who kept looking at his notes. <laughs> it was absolutely the most brilliant, you know, inspiration for a comedian there could ever be because she didn't know why she was funny. And time and time again, you know, I just bump into people and I, I've told this story many times, but it's such a good story that a woman, after she uh, died, a, a woman who lived in her block of flats said to me, oh, your mother, wasn't she funny? She said, I said to her one day, oh, Zelma, do you know, I looked at myself in the mirror today and all I could see was wrinkles and crepey skin and great big bags under my eyes. And she said, your mother said, oh, I've got a mirror like that. <laughs> and it, you know, it was, it was non-stop. She was, and my father was very droll. He was, he was quiet. He didn't like to make any kind of attention to himself. But it was, he was very funny. And somebody told me that they'd gone into his, uh, ready to his shop, tailoring shop on Monument Bridge in Hull, and said, "Mr. Lippman, I'm looking for a particular sort of shirt. It's this, this, and this." And he said, "Your father showed me a shirt." And I said, "That's exactly it." That's just what I want, only darker. And your father turned the lights out. And that was how he would run the business. I mean, this was a man who, when VAT was introduced, he closed the shop. <laughs> he closed the shop. He wasn't going to be told to, he had to have VAT. So, you know, I come, my brother's a very funny guy as well, Jeff. He's two years older than me, and he, uh, he's been speaking all over the world for 56 years uh, on travel, tourism, and, and um, eco-tourism now. You know, he was one of the first people to get with the uh, climate change movement. So 
Uh, yeah, he's he's a very funny boy. And in fact, at my, I think maybe my 60th that birthday, he came, he lives in Brussels, he came over and he, he made a speech and he started it by saying, I am the brother of an only child. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so brilliant and so true because, my, you know, my, my mother was just obsessed with me performing and, uh, and, and didn't seem to realise in any way, shape or form that it might be a bit, make me a bit precocious, you know, a bit. And, there's, and my memory of that group of magnificent women, you know, all in their beautiful Jersey twin sets and their hair set so that it daren't move. Um, having the bridge rolls and the egg and onion and everything and the smoked salmon, if they were lucky. And there always being one face in that circle who was like... <laughs> <laughs> they don't get that performing midget off the sideboard, I'm going home. And, and it's her who I think about when, I, when it's the first night, you know, I have to get that person out of my head so that I, I can love the audience rather than fear them. And it was Joyce Grenfell, actually, who went into the theatre as an amateur. And um, she said that she was surprised to find that many of the professionals regarded the audience as a sort of hostile beast that had to be tamed. And because she was a Christian scientist, she had this view of life whereby I give you something and you take it. And if you don't take it, then we haven't complete. And you know, we don't complete the circle, do we? And if we don't complete the circle, then we're not really communicating, are we? Um, so I took that from her. And often when I just, you know, I don't know what I, I mean, I do tr tend to travel with a speech in my handbag, even if I'm just going to <laughs> wait for those, <laughs> just in case. But you know, if you you meet a, a crowd and, and they don't know really, they wanted, uh, uh, Helen Mirren, but they got you, uh, and uh, maybe they're intellectually superior or something. You know, you have to think bef on your feet, on the balls of your feet, you have to think, how do I engage these people? And um, it is genuinely by going out to them rather than sort of, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I've totally forgotten what the question was, but thank you for asking <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Flora. Hi, Maureen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, hi, Maureen. It's a pleasure. I'm listening to you from New Shalim. I'm in lockdown here, and I think there are a few other people as well. We love you. You're a household name for us, and you're our Helen Myron, so don't worry about that. You describe very, you describe very beautifully the lockdown, and I was really listening to every word. It was so clever, really, and funny, but it was serious. I want to ask you, and you don't seem to have, but ha tell me truthfully, have you lost any of your sense of humour during lockdown in the sense of, I'm sure when you're at home on your own and you're, you know, it's not lockdown, it's mm. normal circumstances, you're talking to yourself, you know, teachers do it, actors do it, you know, oh, what should I say and how would I do it? Did you, in any way, did it affect you? Did it affect you for the better? Did it affect you? Because I, I can only see good things, but I really want yeah. to know because, I, I, you know what? So we see people suffering out there yeah. and you've got yeah. a sense of humour, you don't seem to have lost it, but can you give well, advice? I don't think I've well? lost my sense of humour. Um, I, I have uh, lost uh, sleep a bit. I, I find that most of my girlfriends, my friends are the same. Uh, you, we keep waking up all, all night long. So that must be a sign of anxiety. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm also quite aware that because because I still think I'm 46, um, that I'm quite aware that I can't really do a lot to help other people. And I feel that I should be um, doing something. Uh, you know, some of the Coronation Street people have gone um, in, and helped at food banks and things. Well, I can't do that. I have a partner who's pretty frail and he's, he lives in Gerald's Cross, which is half an hour, 40 minutes drive. So I go there three times a week. Or twice a week sometimes and uh, uh, and I, I, I you know I try to keep up uh, I find that most evenings I'm in the house and uh, I don't really want to watch television because as I say other than the repair shop uh, nothing very much I mean Netflix is phenomenal and, and this you know Stiesel your 
Stiesel is 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 out of it. I mean, I am slightly concerned about the, all these Orthodox Jewish programs suddenly being mainstream, because I'm not sure what it means. They're looking at us through um, a, 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 the, uh, the wrong end of a telescope, I sometimes think. I wasn't keen on the one called Orthodox. I thought it was, um, I thought it, it was sort of um, doing show and tell. Whereas Stiesel, I thought, was not about being Jewish. It was about love um, in the way that Jack's plays were, you know, he was not a Jewish playwright. He re if, if, if it required um, uh, the, a knowledge of Judaism, he made it easy, and he did everything with affection. I mean, that was that was his, 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 his you know, his his task in life was was to be warm and affectionate, whilst being vaguely judgmental. Um, but I mean, I think the stuff coming out of Israel now is phenomenal, and I just hope it doesn't backfire because there are there are there are so many now um, about the Orthodox, and you know, once you take away the veil. <laughs> and you say, look at us, warts and all, uh, you will engage some people, but you will corroborate stereotypes on the, with, with other people who want to believe that. So, um, uh, so I don't watch a great deal of television. Uh, I, w I listen to the radio a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I haven't read as much as I'd like to read. I, I, I find that by the time I actually get into my bed, um, I don't have the appetite for a lot of uh, reading, but you know, you've got to have a book on at any times, haven't you? Because uh, um, otherwise you lose the habit. Uh, I read to my, I do bedtime stories to my granddaughter. I'm doing all the books that I love, the ballet, ballet shoes and the, the Lorna at the Wells. And that that's, that's lovely you know, to be able to share my, uh, love and and she's a um, very literary child so uh, that's great yeah <laughs> but it's nice to know that you're uh, with me in uh, in Jerusalem that's uh, that's very pleasing oh you've gone silent you're you're on mute she is uh, Maureen I, I, I had a, a question for you I believe you started out by impersonating um, Alma Kogan yeah I worked with her sister Sandra Karen a number of years ago. What? What on? Um, well, uh, through a record company that I have, and she wanted to release some of Alma's music. Oh, she was a great friend of mine. She still is. She's, ah, in, she's okay. in LA. Mm. Ah, very nice. So I, I knew her when she was living in Maida Vale. Yep, with Buddy. Yeah, yeah Sandra's. <laughs> you know, uh, the great thing about um, Alma that she was that she was, uh, you know, she was so sparkling and so up and Sandra is so very very down I know. not really because she's funny she's droll but I mean the difference couldn't be more extenuated really. what, what I wanted to ask was related to that uh, when Alma was growing up uh, she wanted to actually be involved in dressmaking and her parents mm -hmm. convinced her that the direction to go was to show business and unfortunately, she died at a ridiculous young age. I think she was 34. Mm. Um, when you were growing up, did you want to go into show business or something else? Or did your parents encourage you in a specific <laughs> direction? Um, yeah, funnily enough, I found a school report which said I want to be, when I grow up, I want to be A, an air hostess. Oh, if you think of anything worse. B, a dress designer. Can't sew a button on. C, an actress. So for all my talk of, you know, having been born with a, you know, mask of tragedy and comedy in my mouth, I obviously had, you know, the thought, and people are always said to you, you know, I was a provincial girl, a Jewish provincial girl, and everybody said, you know, well, you know, you can't really, you can't really be an actress. You've got to have something to fall back on, which is what I called my second book for that reason, you know, something to fall back on. And I, I, I never did have anything to fall back on because I never went to university. I went to drama school, but also because, um, you know, I did go to the labour exchange when I was first out of work after the film Up the Junction. I didn't have a job. I went to the labour exchange and they said, what, what do you do? And I said, I'm a shepherd and I can't find any work in Battersea. And <laughs> I got I got benefits. <laughs> oh dear. 
can, you know. can I ask a question? You can, David, yes. <laughs> as long as it's not, how does this machine work? No, well, I, I think we've worked that out. <laughs> 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 no, so we, we, we actually discussed well, vaguely um, uh, about Sasha Baron Cohen's latest bravado appearance. And you made a very, very funny remark that I can't repeat, but if you want to, you can. But what was, what's your opinion on, 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 on his, his, his uh, what he did? Well, I, you know, what I said was he's got cojones of steel. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I just think he's quite an amazing um, man because uh, they're not pleasant, those rednecks. They would not have taken that well. Um, his singing appeared to me to be pretty, pretty poor, but that's never stopped a country and Western singer from performing. Um, I, I, I think he's just so brave. And I think it must be terrifying being his partner in life because you never know uh, what he, he's, he's strange because he doesn't make pronouncements, does he? He doesn't do what I suppose what I do and Tracy Ann Oberman, you know, sort of defensive remarks about being Jewish. But he just gets out there and combats racism and he's very good on Israel. I mean, he oh. really is. And we need, we need, you know, there are no Black Lives Matters when a, a demonstrations when uh, a young rabbi with five kids gets stabbed in the East End of London. You know, it, 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 we, we have to stand up for ourselves and we have to stand up loudly and clearly uh, and, and um, combat that feeling of, of, the, of, of the Jewish state having a separate entity from any other country in the world whereby its standards have to be above the law like Caesar's wife. We have to stand up and say, when are you going to march, Ken Loach, against China for what they're doing to the Uyghurs, for the concentration camp? When are you going to pronounce, Miriam, on what's happening in Burma and has been for 40 years and the rape and pillage of the Rohingyans? What are you going to say about the Sudan? Are you going to sit next to an Iranian filmmaker? You know, it's, 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 it's utterly beyond me that... that, that a Jewish person would want to victimize Israel when so many other people are doing it. Do they think that makes them cleverer, more intellectual? Does it think it puts them above the hoi polloi that is the rest of us? I, I don't get it. I mean, if you don't like the way the state is run and it's a young state and they do their best and, you know, against such odds, against in a constitution to be told that they're going to be wiped out against Jenny Tong saying they're harvesting organs when they go out to help the victims of Haiti. You know, it, it's, it's, there's no other state on earth who is persecuted the way that Israel is. And yes, they make mistakes uh, as any young country does. The, the United States is a young country and unfortunately it's led by a toddler, but, you know, uh, when they bombed the, the Chinese embassy in the first Gulf War, it wasn't clever, but I didn't see any demonstrations against them. Um, and in fact, when the thing happened with Rebecca Long Bailey and that very silly actress, Maxine Peake, saying that uh, Israel was responsible for the death of George Floyd, um, she never, she never um, apologized. As far as I could say, she said she, she might have got the facts wrong, but it wasn't an apology um, that she and Long Bailey shared the opinion that Israel was in some way responsible. I have been on a platform talking about Burma in the days when Aung San Suu Kyi was a good person. Uh, and I have followed John Pilger saying that Israel was responsible for all the problems in Burma. And when a, someone from the press asked me about this Maxine Peake nonsense, I said, actually, I said, um, I would just like to say that I bought a very expensive cashmere sweater and the elbows have gone baggy. Is there any way I could blame Israel for that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's what it is. That's what it's come to. It's, um, it, you know, ever since the French said that shitty little country, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you can say what you like. 
You can say what you like about it and you will never, ever say the good things. And my dry cleaner around the corner, I was a Yiddish dry cleaner, he says to me, I hope they get the virus, the vaccine first, and I hope they keep it. <laughs> <laughs> because somehow they'd find a way to turn it again, yeah, Israel, uh, the vaccine, you know, like Bill Gates. I mean, who are these people who say that Bill Gates is trying to insidiously take over the world? What is it that people have against successful philanthropists? George Soros, you know. I mean, Soros, we have right across Europe now, we have an emergence of populist right-wing governments. Poland, I thought, might do better than it did. Uh, uh, and... And once again, we're, we're the canary in the mine and we have to stand up and say, I, I, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. You know, that's my feeling. And my kids don't want that. They really just don't. Why does it have to be you? Why? And I can't explain it. And, it, you know, if it gets me into hot water, so be it. It was Rabbi Jonathan Sachs who, about 10 years ago in a speech, uh, said that um, there were eight Jews living in China amongst a billion people, and if something went wrong, they would find a way to blame the Jews for it. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I know. It, it's mysterious how we survive and we uh, do well. Mm. And it's, it's a simple, we go where we're kicked, and once we're there, the generation of, of brains, great brains, put their heads down in the sweatshops and they work and work and work and so that their children can go to university, become lawyers and patronize them. And that's how we've stayed for 4,000 years, we've stayed in this position. And that is unacceptable to people uh, who, you know, who want a reason to be um, bitter and envious. But don't, don't, you think, don't you think a lot of it is ignorance? I. I um... There was a, a, um, an interview with some a Jewish fellow walked into um, one of the campuses in in, um, in America, and it wasn't a particularly Jewish um, university. And he went he went around just asking completely random people, "Can you just tell me what the Holocaust is?" And you, I mean, presumably, I mean, you're talking about reasonably intelligent people. I mean, they go to university, so they had a good education, um, and the answers were, were, they said, well, one, one fellow said, he said, well, yes, yeah, it's some Jewish festival, isn't it? And another one said, they, 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 they were coming out with the most ridiculous things. And that, to me, is the biggest worry of the whole lot. Because well, they, don't, yes, they, but, they don't care, do they, really? They're not interested. But David, you know, it took the Christian Smith family in Newark Oh. open a Holocaust centre to educate 22,000 people a year about what happened because they weren't being taught it at school. We didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, we put up a Holocaust statue. No, don't do it. Put it into education. I don't, I'm not for all these monuments and look what happens to them, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just throw it back out there if anybody wishes to ask a question, if you would like to show your... Um, Before you're... I'm too shicker to answer. <laughs> we are not driving tonight, are we? Driving, yeah, from my living room to my bedroom. I think <laughs> Phil Singer wishes to ask a question. I do indeed. His unmutual hand. Thank you very much. Um, Maureen, you've had a very, very long and illustrious career. Is there one thing that you would say is, is the thing you're most proud of? I suppose that would have to be uh, Rejoice because it was a labour of love to put together her work in a form that would not make uh, be about me and would not really be about her, but somehow would bring us together. And because she was so loved, I had to really prove myself. And it was a, a, a beautiful evening. Um, and I did it for years and I still do sketches of hers from uh from um you know for memorials and stuff and uh and and they still work all these years later they're as funny 
and as bright and lively as ever. So I suppose that would be it. I mean, the thing I enjoyed most was probably Oklahoma because for obvious reasons, you know. Uh, you can't do a three hour show singing and dancing and sweating your guts out and nestling up to Hugh Jackman without um, it print, imprinting somewhere on you the joy of performing. So I would like, I've never really done a drama series on television and I would like before I become too decrepit turn into a sort of human pangolin. Uh, I would like to uh, have a go at something slightly more serious. Um, uh, and, you know, that will either happen or it won't. I've got, you know, I've got various bits and pieces to do this year before I go back to the street. And you never know what's around the corner. I'm, I'm very grateful to have for having a, a, a useful career. It's been, been more than useful, I would say. Thank you very much. Can I, can I ask you a personal question? Um, yeah, don't stop uh, hogging the limelight, David. There's uh, other people here clamoring. Uh, is, there, is anybody else asking? All right, just ask a quick question, then we'll go yeah. to um, No, it, 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 it's something that I've always thought about. Like, what, what did you learn um, from 35 years of being with a great screenwriter? Ah. Oh. Um, he was very kind, you know, and um, he suffered fools gladly, including this one. He was a, a brilliant father and husband. Um, it wasn't perfect because no marriage is, you know, and I, I'm not always proud of things I said and did. Um, but even when he, after he died, you know, my girlfriends came to me almost all of them, and told me that they loved him. And they meant they loved him. <laughs> uh, and that's because he had a big feminine side. And that's why he could write women characters so well. He absolutely um, was, you know, he had a, a mother who, you know, he was the second son. And I think she probably wanted a daughter, but he had empathy and instincts, which are primarily uh, feminine um, qualities and 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 uh, and he was a barrel of laughs uh, right to the very end. You know, I've, I've often told the story, but it is a magnificent summation of his of his character that um, Colin Schindler, writer and friend, uh, adored Jack, and he was you know he looked up to him so much, and he went to see him the day before Jack died in the uh, hospice. And he told me before he went that he was going to tell him, Jack, that he loved him. Um, and, you know, um, Col I should hasten to point out that Colin's wife was a great friend of mine. Uh, and he, he um, and later I went to see Jack and Jack was on oxygen at that time. And he took the oxygen mask off and he said, I said, Colin came, did he, what did he say? And, and Jack said, oh, he, he, he told me that he loved me. And I said, and what did you say? And he said, I didn't say anything. We, we had sex and he went home. <laughs> and that was the next day. So, you know, you can't, you know, that is summing up the essence of the man. But we, you know, we did have 35 years on and off. And uh, no, on. What do I mean on and off? <laughs> um, on and and off. It, was, it was extraordinary to watch how he worked because he'd never, he, as far as I know, he never had writer's block. He wrote 250 plays and he, he, he just would go into whatever room he was given because if we were in a small house, he was, he was often in a cupboard and if we were in a big house, he had a proper study. And then he had my mother to put up with and uh, uh, my dad, he was wonderful with my dad who had no short term memory for many years. Um, even with my nephew, uh, uh, I have an adopted nephew from the Philippines who's a bit tricky and he, you know, Jack would always do something to, to, to kind of focus him. And um, yeah, I mean, I was a very, I've been, you know, a very fortunate girl. I've, I've lost, uh, I've lost Jack, but I, I, I've, uh, you know, I'm lucky to find him really. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, what do you learn from marriage? Uh, I mean, we, we always made each other laugh and uh, I think I gave him a pretty hard time, really. <laughs> <That's quite smooth. laughs> right. do, you, do you mind carrying on for a little bit? Uh, no, a, 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 a bit hot. 
while the questions are still going. Okay, go ahead. Any other questions? No, there, there is nobody on at the moment. Well then, look, would it be an idea if I, you know, I, I do write um, monologues and I did have this show on uh, Radio 5 called Maureen and Friends, which was sort of my, my, my writing. And so um, I could just read you one, um, uh, which is um, called In the Train, as a kind of um, good night. Would that be a, a thought? Would anybody um, fancy in my doing that? Or have you got no questions? It's called, um, yeah, what do you think? Absolutely. absolutely. Sort of a performance. Okay, so this, this was, this was really um, inspired by all those journeys to and from Manchester with people just talking. The whole world is talking, talking, talking. They've all got white things in their ears, you can't tell. In the old days, you used to be able to tell if someone was nuts because they would be talking to themselves in the street, but now everybody is nuts. Evening, a packed mainline train bound for London. Martin, Martin, it's me again, I got cut off. No, no, I'm still on the train, just past Milton Keynes. Yeah, about eight. If we get, uh, if we're not held up. Listen, Martin, put the Cumberland Pie in at one eighty at seven fifteen. All right, from frozen beans. Oh, peas! If you want, I'm not that bothered. <laughs> hello, hello, ah, oh, hello, 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 hello. Ah, oh, sorry, it was a tunnel. I was saying, Martin, Martin, hello, hello. Oh, there you are. What? Ice cream, fruit. There's a taste of difference on the second shelf for Marcy. And Kai can have a Kit Kat if he helps with the washing up, all right? Martin, turn the television down. I can't hear myself think. What are you watching, Cory? Did she stick with that builder? Eyelid. No, don't tell me because I want to watch it on catch up. Uh, no, no, he, no, no. He never even came to the meeting. He said, sorry, something came up, Mel. I know, I know. No, I was well pissed off. Ah, oh, you know, it's not, it's like all I need. They lost the account, but it's not my fault. I worked my butt off. Ah, oh, I don't know, Brexit, I suppose. I didn't have Sky in my room, Martin. Well, nobody knows who to vote for, do they? After what? Oh, for us, I don't know. Cheese, just cheese. No, I never got I never got the set soon as Martin. I was busy. I do have a job, you know, if you hadn't noticed. Excuse me. Excuse me. Could I could I have a word? I'm sorry, I'm on the phone. Yes, yes, I know. Could I could I have a quick chat with Martin? Well, you don't know, Martin. Well, I do now. No. Uh wait, hang on. Mart Martin, there's some woman there. I don't know. I'm sorry, this is a private call. Oh, is it? Sorry, I hadn't realised that. It's been so involving for us all. Could I, could I just have a word? Thank you. I mean, this is flipping weird, Martin. I'm just passing you to this total stranger. I don't know. Hi, hi Martin. Um, this is Deirdre. And I've had the good fortune to uh, travel uh, in the next seat to your partner, Mel. How do you know my name? And I'm a bit concerned. Can I ask you a question? Uh, are you doing peas rather than beans with the Cumberland pie? Well, you know, it's such a cold night, isn't it? And I, I would think the beans would probably be uh, baked beans, are they? Um, I'm presuming. Yes. Well, it's just a bit more warming for the kids, isn't it? Are you having potatoes or rice? Or Are you raving mad? Give me that phone. It's nothing to do with you what vegetables I have in my own house. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, mind your own business then. But Mel, you've made it my business. Don't you agree? I have an intimate knowledge of what Martin is watching on TV, what he wants for dinner, why you didn't have the conversation with your boss. I don't believe this. Could you give me that phone, please? And I know who wears the skinny low-rise jeans in your house. Mm -hmm. In fact, Martin, I probably know a bit more than you do because she hasn't explained why she couldn't pick up the dessert at lunchtime. But I know, thanks to one of her earlier phone calls, because she was um, 
having a bit of, um, you know, rumpy pumpy with Stan from Human Resources in the stationery cupboard. Anyway, I'll hand you back to Mel now and she can tell you all about it. <laughs> Oh, sorry, where are we? That's my stop. Sorry, Mel. Gosh, you have gone quiet. All that talking must have made your throat roll. You get Martin to make you a nice Manuka honey drink when you get home. Safe journey. I, 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 Mom, Mom, it's me, it's Mel. You'll never believe what's just happened to me on the train. Fade out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Can we can we unmute everyone? And they can all give a clap. Um, we can. It'd be rather. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Fantastic. Amazing. Lovely. I wonder if she did. Absolutely loved it. Really lovely. So fun. Thank you. 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 you. Thank 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 you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Every minute was enjoyable. It was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. We hope we can do that again. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, Maureen, sorry, I'm coming back to you. I will. Uh, I am unmuted. You are unmuted. It was uh, we were getting quite a bit of feedback there. So yeah, yeah, that's nice. Good. Well, I hope it's worked well for you, then and I will take my leave. So I'm going to find David Oliver. Oh, David. oh, I'm just unmuting David Oliver so he can. Oh, God. Wow. Oh, that's that's Sorry, Maureen. I just wanted to say, what about the raffle? You're not doing it tonight. <laughs> What's the big prize? I can't, I can't divulge, I can't. Divulge. <laughs> You'll have to come back for that. <laughs> First price is a cure for the virus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's well, second price? <laughs> Two okay. I'll say right. good night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank, thank you very, bye. very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 They're going down fast now, I can see. But well, they would. They're, they're not here for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could do a dance. Well, go on then. <laughs>